Hello and welcome to the Ethical Hacking and Penetration Testing course brought to you by Eduonix. This is Chapter 1, Introduction to Ethical Hacking and Pen Testing. So these are the topics that we're going to be covering. Um, what is ethical hacking, types of hackers, hacktivism, computer crimes and legalities, penetration testing and types, and some practical environment setups as well. So what is ethical hacking? I'm going to try and answer all of these points here. Uh, ethical hacking is usually performed by a certified ethical hacker employed by a company to attempt to penetrate into their system um, using the same mindset and methodology as an actual black, black hat hacker. They're known as white hat hackers. Um, they are trusted security experts with the knowledge um, and skills to be able to employ strategies of someone who would have criminal intent. Hacking can be ethical uh, if you have permission to probe slash attack the network. There is um, respect in terms of privacy. You only perform actions needed for the test. You don't kind of go off on a tangent if you find one particular hole in the leads to another system. You don't go and explore it unless that's already been discussed. You must report all security issues, no matter how small. It's very important that they're reported to the, the correct person as well. If you were to report, um, say, 10 vulnerabilities to your chief operating officer, chances are you wouldn't know what to do with them. Uh, you need to report it to your chief technical officer who would have the, the, the knowledge and the skills or even the staff to be able to delegate the work to, to fix these things. Ethical hackers are they're more than penetration testers. Uh, ethical hacking is a very expansive term which deals with many different hacking and attacking techniques to find security flaws within a system. The aim is to prove um, the security on the target system and a penetration tester is a subset of ethical hacking. If you think of a penetration tester, somebody will concentrate on, on one particular thing. They will they will see a server, they will find vulnerabilities in it, they will attack it and they will gain access to it. An ethical hacker could give um, feedback beyond that remit. They could um, give some practical code feedback before the hack. Um, they could even even in terms of kind of social engineering and things, they could be the guy dressed as a postman trying to get in the front door um, and ask the receptionist what the Wi-Fi password is just so we can send a quick email. That's all ethical hacking. It doesn't have to be somebody sitting in front of a computer uh, in their mother's basement trying to break into a particular system that way. So types of hackers. We've got white, black, grey, elite and script kitty. So, white hat is someone with a non-malicious intent. They're hired by the company that they are attacking. Um, so they're the good guys. A black hat, also known as a cracker. A cracker is the more um, politically correct term for an aggressive hacker. Um, they are someone with malicious intent who tries to illegally crack into a system without authorization. Um, a few motives could be piracy, ID theft, vandalism, credit card fraud, that kind of thing. I have grey hat, kind of in between. Um, they're a mix of black and white, obviously. They may exhibit traits from both black and white. Uh, a grey hat hacker could surf the internet looking for vulnerabilities, but then disclose them to the administrator of the system, or even if the admin was still unsure how to fix it, um, they may offer to repair it themselves for a small fee. Um, so you can see how they are the best of both worlds there. They're being the good guys um, reporting these issues before they're exploited. But then they're saying, well, hang on a minute, I've reported it to you, I can fix it, but it'll cost you $50, you know, that kind of thing. Elite hacker. These are the dangerous guys. They're better than average. They are, I guess they're classed masters of deception and have a good reputation um, among their hacker peers as the cream of the crop. These are the guys, um, the coders, who you really don't want to be working against you. Um, you're more likely to hear about these guys on the news than anywhere else. Script cuties, they're amateurs. Um, probably the same kind of guys are saying that still live in their mother's basement. Uh, who use, they use tools without knowing how they work to achieve their goal. They're probably actually one of the more dangerous hackers. Not knowing what you're doing is much more dangerous in this line of work than actually knowing what you're doing. You could create all kinds of untold damage if you didn't know what you were doing. Hacktivism. 
Now here we've got quite a few different, um, not famous, I guess famous would be glorifying it, um, well-known hacktivist groups. You've got Anonymous, Lulsec, and more recently the Syrian Electronic Army. I'm sure there'll be more than this. These are the ones that you're probably more likely to read about. So a hacktivism, uh, almost like activism, is hacking with a cause, usually political or socially motivated. Hacktivists use the same tools and methods as hackers, however they generally cause disruption to get notice rather than for any kind of monetary gain, uh, for instance defacing a government website with a visible message against that establishment would be um, hacktivism for a cause, or politically motivated. Hacktivists can be individuals or part of a group. You do tend to see the actions of a hacktivist more in the news. Um, probably because they have a broad skill set, so they generally do achieve their goal. Many hacks fail um, purely because uh, the system that you're hacking isn't vulnerable, or if it is, you haven't quite figured out how. If you've got lots of guys with a broad range of experience, you're much more, more likely to achieve your goal. There was quite a notorious hacking of the Sony website in 2011, which most of your PlayStation fans out there will remember. Uh, the, the PSN network was taken down for weeks and millions of user accounts were accessed. That particular hack was estimated to have cost the company over a hundred million dollars um, and was part of a 50-day rampage by a group of hackers known as LulSec or Lul Security, um, which targeted organizations ranging from uh, the FBI to the Britain's to Britain's serious organized crime agency, which is soccer. Pretty dangerous guys. Now, com computer crimes and legalities. I'm not going to go into these too much. Um, many people think you have your uh, Data Protection Act, um, the Computer Misuse Act, and the Copyright Act, and maybe the Criminal Law Act. However, computer crimes and all of the associated laws cover 17 different legislations. You've got Contents, Computer Misuse Act, Copyright, Data Protection, Official Secrets Act, Defamation, Obscenity, Communications, Health and Safety, Computer Evidence, Discrimination, Criminal Law, um, Advertisements and Commercial Activity, International Law and Internet, Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000 and Lawful Business Practice Regulations, Rules and Regulations for the Use of Universities of Greenwich Information Technology Facility and Systems, yes that is actually a legislation, and Use of the University of Greenwich IT Systems as well. So the, the major one, the Computer Misuse Act 1990, is an act to make uh, provision for securing computer material against unauthorised access or modification, and for uh, connected purposes, set out three computer misuse offences as well, uh, as you can see there. Um, unauthorised access to computer material, unauthorised access with intent to commit or facilitate the commission of further offences or crimes, Unauthorized modification of computer material as well. So the maximum prison sentence specified by the Act for each offence were six months, um, five years, and five years, respectively. Uh, amendments to the Computer Misuse Act introduced in um, introduced by the Police and Justice Act in 2006 um, did change that slightly. I'm sure the maximum sentence now is something like 15 years. The only reason I remember that is because there was a program on recently about a guy in America who decided to fire off this um, low orbit ion cannon without knowing what it did until he had the feds knocking on his door. But anyway, we'll come to that later. Penetration testing types. We've got network service tests. This is one of the most common types of penetration tests and involves finding target systems on a network searching for openings in their base operating system and available network services, then exploiting them remotely. Some of these network service penetration tests take place remotely across the internet, targeting the organization's perimeter networks. Others are launched locally from the target's own business facilities to assess the security of their internal network or their DMZ from within, seeing what kind of vulnerabilities an internal user or disgruntled employee could, could find. You then have a client-side test, uh, this kind of penetration test is intended to find vulnerabilities in um, exploit client-side software, such as 
uh, browser, media players, document editing programs, etc. Uh, incidentally, that also covers mobile apps as well. Web application testing, where you look for security vulnerabilities in web-based applications and programs deployed and installed on the target. Remote dial-up or dial. Um, look for modems in a target environment that normally involves some kind of brute force password guessing to log on to the system to discover the modems in the first place. And finally, um, we have a wireless. Sorry, not finally. We have a wireless security test. Um, they test the um, the access you can gain from wireless security, and uh, also the the strength of the passwords you you put on your wireless security as well. And social engineering, which I forgot to mention before, that is um, calling up, pretending to be the the top boss of a company, and having a a shout at the employee who answers the phone saying you need to give me the password to the system because I'm on a very important meeting and I need to get into it now. The person on the, on the other end of the phone panics, immediately tells the guy on the other end of the phone the password. It's been social engineered out of him. There was no physical hacking required. Another thing would be um, somebody dressed up as a mailman trying to gain access to a building. As soon as he's in the building, he installs a physical key logger in the back of the receptionist's computer when she just pops out to, to make him a cup of tea or something like that. All types of social engineering. We'll cover more later. Now, a practical environment setup. Um, I, I will show you the first time you use it, but I use Oracle VirtualBox. Um, it's available for Linux, Windows, and Mac. You do need quite a lot of system resource to be able to run these virtual machines, but any modern laptop should be fine. You also need to install, sorry, enable virtualization on the CPU. So you can get to it from that link there. Um, it's an alternative to, to something like VMware. Personally, I do prefer VirtualBox. Next, we have Kali Linux, which is the latest and greatest um, Ubuntu um, owned, uh, homed, sorry, hacking distribution, preloaded with lots of tools. CentOS. Um, I'm going to be using CentOS for some client machines. The only reason that I haven't advertised Windows in here is that I realize that everything here, these three are free. Windows obviously isn't. If you have Windows desktop uh, licenses, then please feel free to install them. We're going to be doing some practical demonstrations on hacking Windows 7. So if you do have one of them, install it, but don't bother doing any of the automatic updates because it would be best if we could have it uh, unpatched and take advantage of everything that Microsoft did wrong.